Okay, so welcome to part two of this week's content, and this in this section I'm going to talk about three different figures of different, um, or at least different categories of figures of youth. That's figures in of capitalism, political figures, and temporal figures. So firstly, I'll just kind of look at these two images. You can see here a kind of classic use of a sexualized image of a young person in an ad, in the American Parallel ad. And on the other side, there's a photo there, not so famous, but... That photo is of um, young people in an art gallery, and it was posted in um, online, and then there was a bunch of uh, reactions on it back saying, you know, look at all those stupid kids in this fam ga famous gallery not taking any notice of the artwork. Typical kind of, you know, moral panicky stuff about young people, you know, more interested in looking at their phones other than learning or appreciating the art or whatever. What that photo actually is of, though, is kids on a school excursion where they've actually gone around and looked at the art, and now they're um, in, you know, been told by the teacher to look up a bunch of things, and they're going to come back and talk about things, and ask being asked some questions, and you know, learn more deeply about the, the artwork they've been looking at. I think that's a nice little example of the way that young people are represented. They tend to be have their um, be distorted, distorted in a number of ways. On the one hand, they're kind of lazy and stupid and narcissistic, and you know, all that kind of stuff. On the other hand, young people are kind of exploited for their sexiness, their edginess, their coolness, and all that kind of thing. So in terms of the figures in and of capitalism, these are the kind of two sides that I'm, I'm interested in drawing out here. On the one hand, there's figures of young people as kind of mindless consumption dupes, but then within consumer culture itself, the very image of the youth is kind of used over and over again to sell us stuff, you know, those sexy, cool, edgy figures that are kind of co-opted into you know, selling us a particular lifestyle. So on one hand, we have the figures of mindless consumer dupes, and this obviously has antecedents in, you know, critical uh, theory, you know, um, particularly from the Frankfurt School. Um, here you have, you know, young people are basically cultural dupes. They're completely unreflexive about their own position in the world. They just kind of consume mindlessly, um, interested in nothing but instant gratification, um, being ideologically manipulated, manipulated, and these figures particularly appear in moral panics about um, young people's pop culture and youth culture and consumer culture that I'll also talk about in a, in a future slide. This also resonates with some of the at-risk and risk-taking figures that I'll talk about later as well, because there's a there's, there's kind of a crossover here between the idea that, um, I don't know, my uh, references are a bit dated these days, but so, you know, if you listen to Marilyn Manson or something, you're going to end up being a kind of school shooter, which, you know, which is an example that actually happened around the Columbine um, school shooting, um, you know, a couple of decades ago. Um, it was found that the young people listened to Marilyn Manson, all of a sudden, you know, listening to this music kind of turns you into this kind of, um, you know, at, at risk, or sorry, or risk-taking or risky figure. Now, what's interesting about this kind of, what seems to be a consistent gener generational denigration of young people is it seems to go back a long time. And as I think I pointed out um, already that, you know, even back to Aristotle was kind of whinging about how young people today were like, you know, stupid or whatever. So there's something that happens here as people get older, so they, and particularly as they kind of have some influence in terms of, you know, being in politics or writing in the media or producing pop culture as well. Um, they tend to then have this kind of denigrative attitude towards the, whatever the current... Um, um, uh, current young people's kind of practices and pop culture is. On the other hand, um, consumer culture is essentially almost reliant on the on the bodies and attitudes and practices of young people to sell us stuff. Now, obviously, this isn't just you know completely. There are products you know for older people that you know use older people to in the advertising or whatever. But pretty much when it comes to the more general advertising of everyday products. Um, it is those kind of images of youth that are kind of used to sell um, their bodies, their practices, their attitudes. So what's interesting here is it's almost like the, the figure of the young, sexy, cool youth is separated from the actual, you know, living and breathing young people. On the one hand, the living and breathing young people are kind of dumb, narcissistic, you know, short-term thinking, yet their bodies are then kind of separated away to use to sell a stuff to be placed in advertising and things like that. So Harry Bladder is someone that's kind of worked on this and pointed out, and I think this um, quote here is really good to think about that. Labour and commodity markets have liberated youthfulness from its biological age-determined delimitations, 
and have recast select desirable, i.e. profitable characteristics of youth as necessary for the maximisation of individuals' life chances. And this is particularly the case, you know, through encouraging us to buy the right things for this kind of stuff. So this is what often referred to in recent social theory as immaterial and effective labour. Immaterial labour is much of the kind of things we do in capitalism now that we're not getting paid for, um, and it's not necessarily physical. So, you know, every time you go on Facebook or um, TikTok, you know, all the clicks you're doing there are being gathered up. You're actually working for those companies for free when you're on those platforms because, you know, they gather the data and they use it back against us. Effective labour is the way that um, our very presence and subjectivity itself is increasingly used at work, and this is um, particularly useful for analysing the areas of work that young people are doing in a lot in terms of hospitality and service work and stuff like that, where, there, where the kind of physical attributes or tastes of young people are used in that space, but they're not really kind of getting paid for. So you can see this in the work that our group has been doing in hospitality, where, you know, the right vibe of a bar needs the right look of a young person behind it for it to work. Um, so um, and these kind of more fashion, taste um, aspects of young people's lives are brought into that workspace. And so what's being sold there is not necessarily just the wine and beer, it's also a feeling and a, and a look um, and an aesthetic. So we can see how, therefore, the very bodies of young people are implicated in these kind of consumer transactions. So here I've been talking about figures of capitalism, and you'll see some of the things I'm saying here will like interrelate. It's important that all these kind of different figures I'm pointing out aren't just kind of one box to put things in. They kind of interrelate in different ways. Another kind of way of thinking about the figures of youth is in terms of politics. On the one hand, um, young people are implicated in moral panics all the time that I'll go into some detail in a second. But on the other, they're kind of in some ways feared in terms of their politics. Young people tend to have higher degrees of being interested in positive, emancipatory, kind of progressive social changes. And whenever they participate in those things, this is re weird juxtaposition that happens where, you know, on the one hand, there's moral panics about young people not caring about politics. Then on the other, whenever they do it, they seem to be doing it wrong or for the wrong reasons and for the wrong things. So, as I've talked about quite a bit already, young people are figures in these political moral panics, political and media moral panics. Firstly, about lifestyle choices. Always young people's pop cultural practices, consumer practice, lifestyle choices that are always kind of lazy, irresponsible, disloyal, ignorant. Um, and um, this kind of coincides with that kind of generational struggle that I've been talking about already. So there's constant moral panics about young people making the wrong choices. You can see this in particular about like, you know, buying houses. There's nothing about the fact that, you know, the average wage is risen at a much lower rate than the high and house prices have risen and it's becoming increasingly, you know, economically impossible for many people except from privileged backgrounds to be able to buy housing or even apartments in our capital cities. Um, they're kind of blamed for eating too many avocados or whatever. So that's one aspect of it. Another is this panics about deviance. And again, these all overlap with some of the things I'm going to talk about later on. This kind of speaks to somewhat that kind of youth as a transition from being child to adult where we're kind of developing um, ourselves developing kind of limits and all that kind of thing. So these deviants kind of panics are about risk taking, sex, drugs, rock and roll, dangerous driving kind of, and relate a lot to the at, at risk figure that I'll talk about shortly. Then there's the threats to young people. What I kind of, you know, associate with that kind of Mrs. Lovejoy out of the Simpsons, you know, will somebody think of the children kind of thing, um, different threats to the lives of young people. And again, this kind of often, you know, relates back to the pop culture stuff, you know, listening to the wrong things. Um, increasingly with the internet, you know, um, threats to young people's lives coming into their houses through uh, different social platforms and things like that. On the other hand, with this kind of against that moral panic, panic figure of being, you know, politically ignorant and all that kind of thing, youth are often kind of figured as almost revolutionary figures, agents of change. Um, have a look at Sakaria and Tanuk's book about this that's, I think, uh, uh, has some really interesting things to say about how youth is figured in these ways. So we can see examples of that, where particularly when young people get out on the streets and protest. Um, they tend to be like, you know, then told that they're doing the wrong thing and why aren't you at school? In my own research in my PhD, I interviewed a bunch of young people in the Newcastle area. It was right around the time 
where there was a huge march being organised about Indigenous Australia and there was like 250,000 people that walked across the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Um, this is in the early kind of aughts. And, you know, the young people were telling me when I was interviewing that, you know, they were experiencing these things that I'm talking about here. They've been told that they're politically lazy and they wanted to organise a bus trip from their school to go down to um, the bridge and be part of this protest. And their parents and their teachers said to them things like, you don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. You just have to study and work hard and do all these individual things to make your own life better. What are you concerned with all these kind of big issues for? Like, that's not what you should be worried about now. You need to kind of, you know, make sure you get the highest school marks to get the job and things like that. So again, there's a kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't thing going on here. So certainly what also happens here is that many kind of progressive social movements aren't necessarily led by young people kind of downplays the actual involvement of adults in these social movements. And it positions kind of this kind of youthful exuberance um, of being part of that. You now people are kind of seen as being naive and you should need to worry about the these kind of real things when really they are in those spaces addressing actually existing problems. So this again sets up a bit of a dichotomy with um, you know, the between like young people being admired for some things and being denigrated for others. Okay, the next one I want to talk about is temporal figures, where the very idea of youth and one's relation to it relates to our different kind of trajectories and relates to the notion of time. So, um, in one way, kind of youth uh, kind of meant to represent the future. Um, that very kind of cliche, you know, you know, wind between, between my wings kind of thing, you know, I believe that children are our future, which, you know, in many ways they are. But then the way that our own youth, as you get older, it's kind of over romanticized and we tend to like like the things that we were most um, into when we we're in that kind of youth's period and then we kind of tend to negatively um, compare things that come after that um, so this is kind of weird playoff here between young people of the future but then your own youth being in the past so young people are figures of the imminent future young people are often almost used as a proxy for the future there's a lot, kind of a lot of discussion about like you know, if the future's going to be good, if our young people are good, and there's a kind of obviously like implications about morals and ethics and stuff uh, within that. So while the, while the future is kind of unpredictable in many ways, it's kind of intangible, it's also effective. The future haunts the present, just as the past does. And like young people as a figure here are, are brought in to stand into the future, stand in for the future. This has been especially the case as the present feels increasingly precarious and insecure and, 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 and violent. So in one, on the one hand, young people are a kind of figure for the imminent future, but then in a more individual way, our youth is a figure of our nost nostalgic past self. This is particularly becomes you know, more prominent as we get older. So like, you know, as you get, and, and it's, what's interesting about this is the research is it shows that like, even people in their early 20s kind of do a version of this when they get together with people that they went to school with and haven't seen them for kind of a few years. And this is kind of this remember when kind of um, sociality that we kind of think about our high school years in particular through. So our past, our past is kind of present as a form of nostalgia, often in this kind of melancholic relationship um, you know, as, as you get older, you know, you realise you can only die one day and you have this kind of mortality that kind of becomes a part of your life. And we think back about youth in terms of often through rose-coloured glasses, often in a melancholic way that it's so far away, but often in a way this kind of back in my day things were better kind of thing as well. So one's own youth is a kind of absent presence as we get older. We romanticise the past often through rose-coloured glasses, um, but, you know, you can see how both of these figures, the future and the past, they provoke kind of emotional responses and they're used in different ways depending on what issue has been spoken about. Okay, I'll leave this um, section here and I'll come back and talk about some other figures in the next part.